Hey friends, welcome to another edition of our Law and Gospel Devotional, a time each week in which we look at God's two words from all of Scripture. In case you don't know who I am, my name is Eric Sorensen. I'm a pastor at Hillside Church in Roxbury, New Jersey, as well as a contributor to 1517 in all sorts of ways. And it's great to be here with you again this week as we do each week look at an upcoming passage from one of the Sunday's lectionary texts to see what God's word actually has to say to us each and every time. So we'll continue to do that today, but before we uh, get into the passage we're actually going to look at, uh, it's always uh, important to me to get into uh, the other lectionary passages to see so sort of what's going on in the broader theme for the weekend. And of course, this weekend is Holy Trinity Sunday. Now, uh, that, of course, emphasizes the fact that we believe in the triune God in many churches throughout the world. The Athanasian Creed will be confessed, that very, very, very long creed that is sort of the beacon of Trinitarian orthodoxy. Uh, and so it's a special weekend in the church's calendar. But if there's anything I could emphasize about the passages that are used in this upcoming lectionary is that there is definitely an emphasis on the holy. That is the set-apartness of God, the, the uniqueness of God, the, well, to put it in Sesame Street, Sesame Street terms, uh, you know, one of these things is not like the other. God is different. He's distinct. And though we do share some attributes with him, we do not share attributes with him in exactly the same way because, of course, he is perfect in all his ways. And so we're going to hear a lot about the holiness of God in the various passages that we look at. So, for example, in the psalm, Psalm 29, is going to emphasize worshiping God for his holiness. In Psalm 29, verse 2, it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And that really is referencing the angelic host and the witness of heaven all coming together to worship him. And indeed, we doing the same in uh, unity with them each time we come together to worship our king. Of course, now you have also the passage from Acts. Last week it began in Acts 2, uh, talking about the day of Pentecost, because of course last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And this Sunday continues on that same passage in which we see Peter preaching, really proclaiming the work of the holy in our salvation. It is notable that all three persons of the Trinity are mentioned in Peter's sermon involved in the salvation of sinners, which we see quite a few of them saved in that passage. And then you have, of course, maybe one of the most famous passages in all the Bible, certainly the most famous verse, John 3, 16, but the whole passage is John 3, 1 through 17 for the gospel text this Sunday. And that really is about how one is declared to be holy or how one is born again. And of course, Jesus says that happens by the water and the spirit, which we would understand to be referencing one's baptism as the means by which God initiates someone into his family. Well, now we come to the Old Testament passage, which is really where we're going to focus on today. And that is Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8. And if there's anything that could be said about that, it's really what it looks like to be confronted by the Holy this passage is also known sometimes as Isaiah's commissioning to his uh, ministry as a prophet. And, and, you know, I can't help but think any time this passage comes up of a, a skit that the Onion News Network put out some years ago. If you're not familiar, the Onion is a satirical website and they have videos from time to time they put out. And in this one particular video, a journalist claimed to have a, an exclusive interview with the Almighty, just him and God one on one. And sure enough, as he sits down to start the interview, immediately he is confronted by the Holy and he is filled with terror. And the, the rest of the video just shows him crying out, I'm sorry, I understand now, as he's confronted by, by God. And indeed, it's kind of an accurate picture for what we're going to see happen in Isaiah's passage here today. A little context before we dive in. Uh, King Uzziah uh, has just died. He was Judah's king for 52 years. And generally speaking, he had been a good king. I mean, the Scriptures do note that he wasn't perfect, obviously, but he had provided stability and really hadn't given in to the corruption that so many of the other kings of Israel and Judah had. And so he's, he's kind of lauded for that. And understandably, when someone who's been in office that long dies, 
well, the nation is is in disarray a little bit, wondering what the future will hold. And so uh, we in America can kind of relate to this as we think about presidents that have died in office, whether they were assassinated or long before that, whether they just had natural deaths while in office. But there's always going to be a sense of, of confusion and shock when something like that takes place. And so Isaiah, a member of the nobility, goes up to the temple to seek God about the nation's future and what God would have in store for it. And immediately he is forced to recognize who the true and better holy king actually is. We pick it up at verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, you might notice in Scripture from time to time, or at least I hope you do, that when you come to the word Lord, there is different ways that the translators have decided to emphasize the word. Sometimes you'll see if it's letting us know that it's the name of God, Yahweh, sometimes you'll see all caps, L-O-R-D in all capital letters. That's letting us know in English that that is the Hebrew word Yahweh. In this one, it's Adonai, and it, it literally, it's a, it, so you can see the capital L, but then the lowercase o-r-d, and it literally means sovereign. And so what Isaiah is being confronted by is the reality that Israel's true, truly holy king is actually who's standing before him now, who he's forced to be in the presence of as he enters the temple. And what does that lead to? But, well, Isaiah seeing worship of the holy king. Verses two and three. Above him stood the seraphim. Uh, Seraphim aren't mentioned too often in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, they're kind of only mentioned here. But we know that they're angelic beings, but unique looking angelic beings. Look at how they're described. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. The implication is by the wings covering the face and the feet that the holiness of God is so radiant that even the angelic host can't see or have even their feet in the presence of such holiness. And what are they doing? One called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The almighty God is the translation, or sometimes you might hear it said this way, the Lord Sabaoth. It means that God is all powerful. The whole earth is full of his glory. So all day long, these angels cry out in worship to God that he is holy, holy, holy. Now, when we hear that thrice repetition of holy, well, Of course, we can't help but think about the Trinity, but also we have to remember that in Jewish idiom, if you wanted to say things or really emphasize a point, you said things twice. So you can see this in Jesus's ministry when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he's wanting to say, listen up, I've got something very important to say. With them saying it three times, it's emphasized all the more. So God's holiness is central to who he is. And this this all reminds me of something that I think we're prone to do when we think about God being this holy is, well, we're prone to wanting to bring him down to our level because naturally human beings don't know what to do with the holy. We're uncomfortable with it. And so we don't like images of Jesus necessarily overturning tables in the temple and whipping uh, people out of the temple who are desecrating his, uh, his house. We prefer the images of Jesus being friendly and, and approachable. And indeed, that is true about Jesus, but both things are true that Jesus is holy as he is loving and that he is never either. He's never not one of those things that he is always holy. And that is true of God here in this story of Isaiah's. And so what this leads to is a fearing of the holy king. Look at what happens. Verse four, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke And I said, 
Woe is me. In other words, you could say, I am ruined. To hell with me, Isaiah could be said if you were to translate it the way that it would have been understood. I am damned, is what Isaiah is saying. For I am lost. Or, or actually the old way that it's translated, and I, I, I like this better, is I am undone. I am unraveling, as the old song from Weezer talks about, being undone and having his sweater unraveled so that he's exposed to the world. That's the way Isaiah feels. He's completely and utterly exposed before a holy God. And what in particular is exposed about Isaiah? For I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah becomes absolutely aware that his speech is unholy, that his words do not, they're not worthy to be in the presence of God. He recognizes his sin and not just his, but his people's sin. Because he says, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the Almighty God, the All-Powerful One. And rather than Isaiah saying, this is wonderful, Isaiah says, I am doomed. There's nowhere for me to hide. I am a sinner in the hands of God. What can be done for such a person? You see this response, by the way, all the time throughout Scripture, the human response to holiness. You see terror. You see despair. I can't help but think of sort of the parallel to this passage in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus does this miraculous uh, catch of fish for Peter. And Peter's first response is, uh, Peter's first response isn't like, wow, man, that's great. Thanks for catching all this fish for us. But Peter, upon recognizing that somebody far above him is in his presence, says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. That's the natural response. And indeed, the natural response is out of despair to just confess, as Isaiah does here, to in terror say, I, I'm not worthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I know I deserve damnation. So holiness brings this out of the sinner, a recognition that we must fling ourselves upon God for mercy because we have no hope in it of ourselves. And what does that lead to? It leads to the greatest miracle of all, that though our sins are many, his mercy is more. Immediately upon hearing the confession, the holy king does not punish Isaiah, but atones for Isaiah. And indeed, the same thing happens for us as we recognize who God truly is and we come to him and say, I am damned in and of myself. I have no hope in and of myself. As the law does its work exposing us for who we really are before a holy God. Right then, as we say, I need mercy, like the tax collector before us in the famous parable, we are reminded, we are declared to be forgiven, atoned for. And so verse 7 of Isaiah, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What happens there in that passage is the seraphim are told to go over and grab, uh, go get some tongs and get some hot coals from the heavenly sanctuary and burn Isaiah's lips. But through that burning of the unclean lips, they are cleansed and thus he is atoned for. Thankfully, the burning that we all deserve for our atonement is not given to us. In fact, it was taken out upon Jesus Christ, the righteous one who became sin for us. He is our atonement. He is the one that stands before the heavenly throne and says, I have done everything necessary to pacify any wrath 
that might be there against these people, that deservedly is there against these people. Yes, they may deserve condemnation, but I have won for them salvation. And the Father heartily agrees with joy because it was all of the Trinity's plan for all of eternity past that this would be God's will for his people, that they would be atoned for. And so what happens? And I love this picture because I, it's such a great picture of how God chooses to work in this world. The Holy King sends us out as ambassadors. Look at verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And the very next verse is Isaiah is commissioned to preach God's word, to share God's word with the world. Isn't that a phenomenal picture of grace and how God restores that which has been lost? The very thing that Isaiah is condemned for, his lips, his speech, God now has reversed through his atonement and caused Isaiah to have power to use those lips for good, to be his ambassador to the, to the world with the gospel that he has saved him with. And we are sent out the same way. As we have been atoned for, now we go out sharing that same message with others, that though our sins are many, his mercy is more. His forgiveness is real. It is guaranteed through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because he's done everything necessary to make up for our lack. So that is our devotion for today, folks. I hope that encourages you and I hope you see how we really are not much different from Isaiah. As we come into the presence of a holy God, we have no hope in it of ourselves. The only reason we have hope is because of what God has provided through the atonement, won for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a great week. And I'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. God bless.